and welcome back. Thank you for tuning in into the special edition of the Michael Deacon program. In just a moment, I'll be joined by Mr. Marshall Masters as we continue our exploration of the Planet X series. First, I want to mention that California has been declared a state of emergency. For those who don't know, I'm currently in Orange County, my second home away from home. You might wonder how this relates to Planet X. Well, the wildfires we're witnessing out here are a small glimpse of the potential scenarios we could face as Planet X approaches Earth. This situation serves as a reminder of the challenges that may lie ahead, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned for that. Now, as you hear the sound of my voice, we are only 52 days away from the presidential election day. Could Planet X pause the election? This was, of course, proposed to us by my guest, Mr. Marshall Masters. And in a moment, as I said, you will be hearing him. And uh, Marshall, I do want to welcome you for being a part of the program. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on the matter ahead, my friend. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. We always have a good show, Michael. We really do. And of course, you need no introduction here on this program. Everyone knows who you are by now, my friend. And it is so good to see you on my screen. Hi, it's good to be back. And we've got a lot to oh talk about. Oh, my God. About. Yes, we Stuff's do. Stuff's happening, man. Stuff is happening. But you know what I want to say to your audience versus I'm going to be showing you things that are going to be disturbing. And I'm going to be talking about things that are going to be disturbing and concerning. And what I want you to know, I do not want you to be so. I don't want to make you afraid or concerned or worried or any of that. Marshall, it's too late. I've been I've been afraid <laughs> being out here in California <laughs> with all the fires and, of course, oh, yeah. all the potential danger these earthquakes will have and, of course, Planet X nearing uh, planet yeah. Earth. Yeah, and you got that, that whole section of the coast there north of you that's getting ready to it's sinking a, a foot a week. That's right. It's sinking. It was a Paslo... Robles or something like that. Palo Verde, yes. Palo Verde, yeah. It's uh, 250 homes are going Ooh. south, literally going south. Yes. Um, so I do. But the point of this knowledge sharing that we're doing today for all of you out there is first, as an audience, you guys are smarter than the average bear. All right. Deal with a lot of audiences, and it varies. You have newbie audiences, and they're just clicking through. They want the entertainment. You guys go for the deep dive, which I really like. And if you understand these things, it prepares you to cope with it so that when things start going sideways, you're not racing around like a chicken without a hit. All right? Other people are going to be, oh, yes, sirree. you're going to be surrounded. All these people that have for all these years humiliated you with negative contractions. I can't. This couldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't, you know, always with the negative contractions. What we're telling you is we're telling you this, sharing this. I want to share this with you so that you're empowered, so that you understand it and that you can move through events, because it is daunting. When you see the enormity of what is coming, you're going, oh my God, how is little old me going to get through that? All right? And if you're prepared here and here, you'll get through it. You'll get through it. And you'll pull a lot of people with you, and folks are going to follow you because you know what you're doing. So this is not about telling you how you're going to die. This is about telling you how you're going to evade that, live, and thrive. All right? So with that, I uh, want to bring you up, because last time we were talking, I believe we had a good chance to uh, show you what's happening on my Yowza Chat Telegram channel. Uh, we're doing all kinds of... Uh, observation videos and I run that it's a very popular group 
Uh, it's running about 420 members now. And I run it with a tight fist because I'm continually under attack by trolls and others. I mean, the suppression is nonstop. And I'm sure you you know that all. Oh, too. absolutely. Yeah, you know, this is the way it is. It sucks. I've gotten but used to it, though. You know, it, it happens. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the elites are like hemorrhoids. You wait for them to dry up and go away. You know, <laughs> that's quite the visual. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it? So, talking about visual, let's get visual with something that's starting to happen right now on let's my Yow's Observations channel that is just blowing our minds. So, let me get the share screen going here. That do 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 do, and there we go. I don't need audio. So here we are. You see that uh, I'm into my Yowza observations group, and look here. This is um, and, and it is. It looks possibly there could be three objects, but there's two very clearly especially when you go to the gamma. But again, there's that one there. And I, you know, I, I'm going to come back and look at this because we're getting more of these where we see three objects. Yes, three. Not two this time, three. Three. Now, I will tell you, this is nothing new. We were seeing this years ago during a, for, for a certain period of time. And then we stopped having them. Okay, so let me go down to, by the way, here's a good graphic. This is something I did, and people are quoting it. This is Nemesis. Here is Helion. It has a moon, Harrington. I named these moons, Harrington and Farada. The names of these planets are what is known in the Nemesis mini constellation system, the the Anunnaki who lived there. Uh, you have Helion with the moon, Harrington, and Helion is a massive gas giant. It's very bright, and it in the in this mini constellation, it makes it look like it's a second sun to Nemesis. Then there is uh, Arboda, which is a large rocky planet. And there's a slave race on there that the Anunnaki maintain. And then the outermost planet, Nibiru, and its moon, Farada. And I named uh, Farada after uh, the astronomer, uh, Carlos Munoz Farada. I was just and, about to ask. Uh, a Harrington is named after the astronomer who was uh, assassinated for his work on Planet X. That's right. Was, uh, with the government, Robert H. Harrington. Shout out so, to him. Let me come down here. Uh, what's interesting is um, we are seeing this one here just disturbs me no end because it's right in my, I'm in Maine. And when I first got to Maine, I actually lived in Southwest Harbor oh. uh, for five months. That's Nemesis right there. And it's showing up almost daily. Very intense, by the way. Very intense. Hmm. All right. And it's like, hello, this is my home. All right. So here is... Uh, Here you can see this is a single object. It's a very clear observation. This is just stunning. This is stunning. And uh, because you can see in the upper left hand corner. And what I love about this one is Nemesis is punching through the clouds. It's a beautiful it's, video. By the way, where is this, by the way? Um. It doesn't say it, doesn't it say. is, um, you know, it's so hard to get people to contribute that information. But we have, we're seeing this same thing again, where it's red, which tells us it is still in its perihelion phase. It's going away from us. 
when it starts coming towards us, it'll change from red to blue. And that's when yeah. we'll be worried. What's interesting, this one is from Antarctica. Look. Oh, you might have. Um... There's the sunset over there. And there's Nemesis over there. You know, what I will tell you mm -hmm. is when you hear the people making these recordings, it's it's interesting when you see where the, the sun and the objects are close together, directly in front, people are just trying to sort it out. What's that? What's that? But when they see stuff like this where they have a big, you know, a big something on one end of the horizon and about 30 or 40 degrees the other direction is the sun, this really spooks people and it, it, it disturbs them. Now, I've had people say, well, there's normal effects. They see this all the time. If they're seeing it all the time, they wouldn't bother doing the video. All right. And secondly, they wouldn't be emotionally upset by what they're seeing. They would be accustomed to it. So you get folks that are trying to, and that's the trolls. They're, they're still trying to, doing their best. Now, here's an excellent one. Three sons. Look at that. Wow. And this is, here's the gamma on it, but um, it is, and, and what I did was, uh, I, I just looked at this and I'm going, my God. The sun is behind the horizon. Nemesis is behind the horizon. That's got to be Helion up and to the right. And, um, and of course, the, the skeptics out there will say, well, that's just a lens flare, a sort of mirage of sorts. This is something I've been hearing quite often when we do this series, Marshall. Well, here's a gamma test. Yeah, and people do that they because say that, they don't yes. know. All right, or you have a lot of trolls. A lot of trolls, you have yes. No that's idea it. how many trolls there are. There's an army of trolls that are throwing all this down. So, and they're going to do lens flare, this, that, whatever. When I do a gamma test, and here I'm teaching my folks, is that you look for this hot spot. All right. And that's with digital imaging is that you're going to have an intent, these pixels are completely hosed. And that's what you're looking for. That's the center. And then you can see around the edges, right? It starts differentiating. This was one that completely was stunning. And I just observed this for a second. There's the sun. There's Nemesis. But why does Nemesis, Nemesis have this perfect-looking Terminator, all right? It looks like the moon, one of the cycles of the moon. That's right. Well, I did a check on it. I did a gamma. And what happens is it is a third object. And it's likely our Boda or Nibiru in front of Helion, which is causing this. All right. It's perfectly in nature. You don't have um, what we're seeing. You can have. You know, planets are perfectly circular, all right? And that's what's going to appear, and here you go. So we're seeing this um, again. You know, this is more the typicals that we're seeing. And what's interesting, what I find interesting with this one is that you can see the clouds moving in front of Nemesis, and if somebody tells you that's a lens flare, they're either a deep state operative or they're as stupid as a box of rocks. Now, here's another one. Another three objects in the sky. And what's really fascinating with this, and it's we get these from overseas a lot, and these are older cameras and they don't have the resolution. But <clears throat> you have two objects that are behind this far horizon, all right? At, uh, it's across a body of water, and you can tell it's land on the other side. And I think this is a brilliant shot. 
this is really stunning, uh, seeing all of these multiple sun in the sky uh, things here. Again, you know, we have the sun, we have something going on here, we have something, this was in Japan in 2023, and uh, so this is the kind of stuff that we're seeing. It's reported on Yowza observations on Telegram. And come on by, join, and get in the conversation. Yes, definitely go join Marshall if you are curious about these photographs and this, um, this video presentation we have for you. Yeah. So what we can do now is let me get into... Let's start with this. Uh, our topic tonight is Revelation and Planet X, and it really is uh, a discussion coming from my book, Revelation and Planet X, The Colburn Bible Indigo Connection. And what I need to explain to everybody is, uh, because we're talking about Revelation, I am not a Christian. All right. You're not I a Christian. I'm not a Christian, no. Um, and... I, as I explain in my book, I come from, uh, my mother was Jewish, my father was Catholic, and when I was nine years old, I chose my to be Jewish, not that I understood it, I just understood that all of my relatives on my mother's side in Europe were killed in the concentration camp, so I just wanted to honor them. Uh, but it provoked a horrific amount of anti-Semitic abuse from my maternal grandmother for several years. And uh, it was, I, I don't want to have to say any of it, it was pretty ugly. And enough that afterwards, to me, Jesus became a death word. And uh, I had to deal with that and move through it. Um, I didn't get any help from fellow Jews. I mean, for them, it's like, Hey, what are you going to do? Oh, you know, hey. right? uh, it's the life. It comes with the ticket. But it was actually what I call spiritual Christians that really helped me and deal with this and move me through it. Um, a spiritual Christian is very simple. I'm going to ask one question. And at the end of that, you're going to know if you're a spiritual Christian or you're not. Okay. You ready for this? I'm ready. Okay. Here it is. How many study groups and churches have you been kicked out of because you keep asking questions you're not supposed to ask? I think maybe only one in my entire lifetime, but that's when I was uh, really young and asked way too many questions, yes. Yeah. Well, if you're out there having a response like that, most of them just start laughing their ass off. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it just gets me, you know, it's like how many, I was like, oh God, three of this, two of that, whatever, you know, and they go on. And they were the ones that really helped me. What I found out later when I was writing the book and getting into it is that I can, as a psychic, I can work with ascended masters. I, you know, I do readings with creator. They're helping me write my books all the time. And uh, and helping me to stay one head, stay ahead of the nasties who are always trying to take me down. And uh, I, if if I were to go back, and the reason why I can't do a reading, I can't yeah. talk to Yeshua. All right, and I call him Yeshua because in heaven the rule is you're called. You, you honor the mother. So he was named Yeshua by his mother. They did not, she didn't name him Jesus. So in heaven, he's Yeshua. And um, that, that's okay. Call him Jesus. It's like zip code. You know, Jesus is a five digit zip code, Yeshua is a nine digit zip code. Either way, the mail gets there. Don't worry about it. And um, however, though, I cannot initiate a dialogue, a channel. I can't open up and do a reading with Yeshua because uh, my soul is so badly scarred by these years of anti-Semitism when I was a child. And I was told that it, those memories could be addressed to try and change that, 
but that I would run the risk of uh, PTSD. Very serious. That it would probably wreck me for the rest of my life. Wow. So, yeah, that sounds pretty serious. Uh, yeah. So I don't do it, but I, I think it's fair. People have to understand that I'm talking about revelation, but I'm not talking about it as a Christian. I'm talking about it as a researcher. And for me, the Holy Bible is a really magnificent wisdom text. Understood. And yeah, some, some Christians out there, the fundamental Christians would say, well, the things that you're dabbling in are sorcery, Marshall. Yeah, you know. You know how, uh, they, you know how they go. Oh, don't, you know, you forgot extra biblical while you're at it. Right. Uh, so what I know is spiritual Christians, okay, cool. They go with it. All right. Their understanding. And the other ones, they don't like me and I can't talk to them, so why bother? All right. I don't blame uh, you. It's criteria. And uh, it goes. So for those of you out in the audience who think uh, badly of me because I am not of your particular eschatology or faith or whatever you do, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> you know, I'm just doing my thing. So last time we were on, uh, we talked about, you know, how the meek inherit the earth number 13, That's time right. jumping for freedom. That was immensely successful, all right? And uh, your folks came in, people were reading it, and I hope a lot of them took it to heart because this is really about the ascension process. You know, if you start thinking in three dimensions, you are now moving yourself up through the continuum and into the fifth dimension, as we call it, the dimension of service is more properly called. And uh, I think the concepts we're going to talk about today are, are going to build on this. Uh, specifically, the article is, Could Planet X call, Pause the Election? And <clears throat> this is a very popular article. And... What I'm talking about is a possibility that, you know, right here you can see, these are images that I actually took from my Yowza chat site, big panel. This is my favorite one. It shows, you know, it's like the astronomers, there's no such thing as Planet X. Yeah? Go have a smoke. Look up. You might surprise yourself. And... We go into how it's affecting the earth. You and I were talking beforehand what's going on in California right now. Um, that particular area that's sinking. We have land tears. There's all kinds of things going on. And it it's happening all the time. People are reporting it. So this gets into what I am saying is that in my book, Being in it for the Species, uh, the guides predicted that there would be an eruption in this area of the planet along the western side of the Ring of Fire that mm. would be massive. Yeah. And what we're saying in this article is that at this point here in the Philippine Sea is where the crust of the Earth is its thinnest. It's at, at the Marianas Trench. It's maybe five miles deep. Okay, that's it. That's pretty thin. And it's a very, you know, that's a pressure point. If something's going to pop first, that's what's going to pop. And if it pops, it's going to slam into Hawaii and the entire west coast of North America. And Yay. it's going to be devastating. All right. Uh, here is that town, you know, Rancho Palo, uh, Palo Verdes. Palos Verdes. Okay, and you can see. Yeah, look at that. I feel. Look at that house. The way it's, you know, half of it's leaning down. The right. roof is split. You know, that was an expensive home. Yeah, I bet that's that a multi-million-dollar home right there. Oh yeah, Somebody especially where the property pretty, is. Yeah. So, and I get into this article now. <clears throat> what I want to do is in my book. All right, and go back to Revelation and Planet X. <clears throat> I used uh, 
Revelation 8 for this book because it fit like Legos. So <clears throat> let's go, let's look at Revelation H, 8, excuse me. And it starts with 8, 7. Revelation 8. Now, by the way, YLT 98 stands for Young's Literal Translation, 1898. This version of the Bible is uh, used for research because it's very precise translations, but it's not as enjoyable reading as other editions. And I think the fact that the Bible is published in several different editions, different translations, different approaches, I think that's a great thing because it's about access for audiences to material that is more in line with what they're interested. So if you like one, you like the King James, fine. There's other ones, and they're they're very good. Again, for me, it's Young's literal translation because this is for research. So let's start with the first messenger. And the first messenger did sound, and there came hail and fire mingled with blood, and it was cast to the land. And the third of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. So let's decode this. All right. First off, let's look at specific words. I look at hail. And hail, there's two definitions. And the second one fits. It is something that falls within the force and quantity of a shower of ice and snow. All right. So hail could be something like it, or it could be, you know, pellets of ice larger than five millimeters in diameter. And uh, I've been through some bad hail storms and Oh my gosh, you know, it's a good reason to have a garage for your car. You get caught in those and it's like, you see a car, it just looks like it's been hit with a ball peen hammer 10,000 times. So <laughs> that's a problem. So you can see hail, we have that defined. All right. Now, let's get to fire. Oops. Let's get to... Fire mingled with blood. Ooh. All right. Scary. Come on. I don't want this. They have this new AI feature they're trying to impose on you. Yeah. And. Damn computer. I got it. Uh, uh, anyway. So. Fire mingled with blood. God. And it was cast to the land, and a third of the trees was burned up, and all the green grass. So, fire mingled with blood. How do you have fire mingled with blood? First off, what we have to talk about is what's being described here. Is These are meteorite showers. Very, very deadly meteorite showers. And they're going to contain iron oxide, and something called shrebersite. It's a mineral consisting of iron, nickel, phosphide. Now, the thing about shrebersite is that when, it's, when it strikes the water, it then begins uh, corroding and producing phosphorus. The two things that make algae blooms massive are nitrogen and phosphorus, all right? If you think back to, um, if you think back to the 10 plagues of Exodus, the Nile turned red, right? What oh, happened nuts. is the hail and fire landed in there, the shrubber site, began producing, as it corroded, started producing um, uh, phosphorus. And then next thing you know, the, the Nile went from red to green. 
with blue-green algae. Blue-green algae will produce uh, something that's called microcystin, and it's very toxic. It can cause liver failure it, in sufficient dose. It can kill large animals and humans. And this is what made the frogs jump out of the water. It burns the skin. Uh, this, you know, it killed the fish. And you just actually take the whole plagues, the ten plagues of Exodus, and you put them in scientific order, and they just connect like Legos. It's really perfect. So let's go back to Revelation. And so you had fire. The fire is because you have phosphorus in the Schreber site. And there's phosphorus in the, and the phosphorus is like the phosphorus in your match. <clears throat> now, what happens is, is that it is the process of ablation as the meteorite is falling through the sky and burning. It converts the phosphorus in the shrubber site to something that will ignite, right? And then that's the reason why it's hail and it's fire and it's coming down to the ground. It's mingled with blood. That's the shrubber site, which turns the water. And it was cast to the land and the third of the trees was burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up. So all of the green grass was burnt up tells you that this is going to come in large blankets. It's not going to probably be consistent all the way around the grove, all right? And the what I want to show you that 8-7 is coming because the event that I talk about with the eruption, subsea volcanic eruption that could happen in the Western Pacific, in the Philippine Sea, uh, would be horrific. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people could die from something like that. It would be devastating for Taiwan, China, Philippines, obviously. And there's no land barrier whatsoever between this area of the Philippine Sea and the West Coast of the United States and Hawaii. So you're going to have these massive waves from this subsea eruption, which would be massive many times. Better learn how to swim. And it would just come right in and just tear up the whole coast, the west coast of the country. That would, as I mentioned in my article, this is going back to could Planet X pause the election, is here's the the... The bada bing, the, the gotcha, right here. And let me bring that up. Ooh, yes. So you can see Washington, Oregon, California, and down here is Hawaii. That's 78 electoral votes in play after the tsunami hits. That is more than enough cause to pause or delay the election. When you have that much. That's uh, pretty frightening, uh, Marshall. Huh? I said that's pretty frightening. Yeah, it is. It, it's it's really concerning. So this is uh you know definitely what I'm showing in the article that would justify a pause in the election. So what comes next after this event? All right. Now we we have this catastrophic submarine event that occurs. What happens? And there, here's just you can see a little graphic that shows it. What comes next goes to Revelation, and that is in Revelation the next thing that we see. After that will be Revelation 8, 7, which is what we just talked about, hail and fire mingled with blood. And this would probably happen in the first quarter of next year. What will happen after that is 8, 8, and this is big. And 
by the way, before I get into 8.8, I want to show you, this is what it's going to look like when we start flying into the Nemesis dust cloud that surrounds Nemesis and this iron oxide shrubber site. Uh, it's falling on the earth and it's not going to be global consistently. It'll be patchy here and there, and it'll come like summer rains and go like a summer rain and be. But this is pretty much what the visual would be like. We're going to be seeing. This is yeah. a very good example. And so, you know, who's to say that we're not already getting some drift into the nemesis cloud with that oddly enough by the way some residents in up up in the mountainous areas where the wildfires are uh, if you had seen some of their videos it looks very much like what you're describing here so right. this is like a prerequisite of what might happen mm -hmm. yeah we're going to have Wild. wildfires everywhere it is going to be devastating because you're going to have these flaming meteorites showers striking the earth they're going to be these meteorites are going to be about the size of a boar's head that's what the guys tell us mm. right um and they're if if one of them hits a house that house is not going to be habitable afterwards it's going to really mess it up and so a lot of people are going to really suffer with this but then comes the big bada bing, all right? And the second messenger did sound, and as it were, a great mountain with fire burning was cast into the sea, and the third of the sea became blood, all right? Uh, this is something that is mentioned in my book, Being in it for the Species, I had a prophecy given to me in 2013 by the guides, and it's going to be a large asteroid. It will hit in the eastern Atlantic region. I believe it will be a targeted asteroid. Uh, it will be a guided weapon because it hits uh, a very, very vulnerable point where all of the internet, 95% of the traffic on the planet is, is handled through terrestrial uh, fiber. And um, there is on um, the area connecting uh, Europe with America, the main feeds go through a channel. And so there, it's a big nexus area. I should have had a graphic on here. That would have been good for everybody. And it's going to hit all that, and it's going to take out the Internet completely. And that's the reason why I think it's aimed. So with a great, mount, a great mountain with fire burning was cast into the sea, and the third of the sea became blood. But we already know about the iron oxide, the Schreber site. And uh, die did a third of the creatures that are in the sea, those having life, and the third of the ships were destroyed. So this really tells me this event is confined pretty much to the North Atlantic, all right? And this is, you know, a third of the ships, well, <laughs> that's easy. Uh, we're a seafaring nation, all of our we have all these ports, military ports, commercial ports on the East Coast. You hit them with a wall of water, anything inside that port is going to be smashed and bashed. And, um, and then the third messenger did sound, and there fell out of heaven a great star burning as a lamp, and it did fall upon the third of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third of the water doth become Wordwood, and many of the men die of the waters because they were made bitter. This is Nemesis that he's describing. Uh, out of heaven, out of the heaven, a great star burning as a lamp, and it did fall upon the third of the rivers. Well, this would be... You know, whatever's coming from this flyby, 
and the name of the star is Wormwood. You know, there's in Australia Wormwood um, Observatory. Now, <clears throat> what I believe is saying here in, in 11 with Wormwood is that, you know, it, it fall upon and upon the fountains of waters. All right. So, again, we're going back to the Schreber site and the iron oxide in the water. Then, and the fourth messenger did sound, and smitten was third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars that darkened may be the third of them, and that the day may not shine, the third of it, and the night in like manner. This is a, and I write about it in the book, this is when, this is going to, we're going to see this approximately in around the 2029, 2030 time frame. This is when Nibiru is passing between Earth and Venus. And this is, you know, this is what's going to happen. And then, you know, and I saw and heard one messenger flying in mid heaven saying with great voice, woe, woe, woe to those dwelling upon the land from the rest of the voices of the trumpet of the three messengers who are about to sound. Now, <clears throat> however, the, and it goes into Revelation 9. But what describes the pole shift in much better detail is actually found in Revelation 6. And Revelation 6, and again, guys, I, I'm, I'm not reading this as an inspired Christian. I'm just reading this as a Planet X researcher, all right? And it's wisdom, and it's great wisdom. And as a psychic, I understand that the men who did this, who wrote this, I feel great compassion for them because I understand what they went through. It's torment. You're going into the continuum, into the Kashic record, and you are seeing far into the future terrible, terrible things. And folks have to understand when you see things like that, it profoundly wrecks your sense of peace in the present time. Because you're going, wow, if this is the end of our species, I feel pretty insignificant now, small, hopeless. You know? So for whoever was writing Revelation, my heart goes out to them. I understand what they were experiencing. But let's get down to um, the sixth seal, which is in Revelation 6.12. And it's 12, 13, and 14. This perfectly describes the pole shift. And I saw when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, a great earthquake came, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And we've already been through all of this before. Now, here's where it really gets good. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree doth cast her winter figs by a great wind being shaken. Now, it was 14 that cinched the deal for me. And heaven departed as a scroll rolled up, and every mountain and island out of their places, they were moved. All right? And so <clears throat> this for me... Revelation 6, 12, 13, and 14, absolutely the best pull shift description in the Holy Bible. I was about to say that. Um, Revelation, a favorite part of my reading every anytime I open a, a Bible, the few times that I have, I always go to Revelation and always thought, yes, this is describing a great pull shift, a great solar event. Right, right. Well, that, that gets my visuals. So I'm going to take, cut my screen display. No worries. And we can come back here. And there we are. There you are. In full screen, yes. So let's talk about practical strategies of what you can do. Because you, what you're seeing coming, you should understand that your sources of potable water 
are going to be greatly impacted. Now, uh, the city that I think is going to feel it the worst is Las Vegas, because Las Vegas is very dependent on Lake Mead. And Lake Mead is already so low that the city of Nevada paid to have a third inlet tunnel below the two that are currently feeding the water turbines because when the lake level gets low enough, they'll have to shut down the turbines. They won't have power, but with what's left in the lake, they'll have drinking water for the city. Right. And they're going to have to have their power from somewhere else. Well, what happens if Lake Mead turns into a big slush bowl, just, just red oxide sludge everywhere? That's it. Nothing potable. What happens in... You know, Las Vegas, no power and no water. Las Vegas, how long do you think it's going to live with that? Not too long. Those are where all the savages are. That's right. So A lot of holes buried in the desert out there, too, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, <laughs> I remember the, they said years ago Jacques Cousteau wanted to dive to the bottom of Lake... Uh, um, Mead. What is it? Uh, the one where they shot the movie uh, Tahoe. All right. And Tahoe's very, very deep. Uh, Tahoe is not a natural lake. Tahoe was actually created by magma that sealed off a valley and then it just filled with water. And uh, Jacques Cousteau wanted to dive down to the very bottom of it with one of his submersibles. And he couldn't get permission because they were afraid he'd find all the bodies the mafia had thrown over there. That's right. You know, and it's a, hey, there's Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> you know? That's good. Get the lights on him. Um, but now you understand water is going to be a real concern for you. Also, safety from the sky. You need to be mindful of places you can go to where you're not going to be caught out in the open by these meteorite showers that are going to come down, the hail and the fire, because they're going to be very sudden. They're going to come on like a sweet summer rain, just out of nowhere. You know, it's not everywhere. It's spotty. This gets rain, that gets rain a little bit, and then it moves off and it goes. And it comes and goes, and it's spotty, and it's completely unpredictable. And if you're caught out in the open, you're going to have a really bad hair day. And so you don't want to do that. You want to start thinking about shelter for above your head. You want to, you know, start looking at uh, people are going to, you know, go to underground parking garages uh, they'll find structures that'll, you know, protect them with the water. It's going to have to be ways of filtering the water, getting everything out of it so that it's potable. Uh, drilling wells, these are going to be concerns. Growing food is going to be very difficult. Uh, you start having all of this iron oxide falling all over these big corporate farms. That's it. Their crops will die. They have nothing to harvest. And these companies will fail and go out of business. So you're still going to have a certain amount of farming going on, more opportunity farming than anything else. Uh, you know, it could be if you've ever driven through an area that a tornado has hit. Now, I have when I lived in Texas, and it's stunning because. You see one house that absolutely is leveled to the foundation. And the house next to it is not even touched, you know. Tricycles are still in the front yard unmoved. Nothing happened. Uh, across the street, you see the outer walls and nothing on the inside. And it's just this kind of random violence that goes on. So you have to understand that's what's going to be coming once it starts to happen. And for those of you who are living in coastal areas bordering large bodies of water, 
particularly the West Coast, the East Coast, and um, Chicago on the Great Lakes. Now, in the Gulf of Mexico, and it, uh, Texas looks like it'll do better, although there's going to be Louisiana is not going to do very well. So you need to be mindful of these things and start thinking, well, uh, once these come, what am I going to do? Well, you got to know when to bust a move. You got to know when you're going to be able to tell the family, hey, let's go live in a concrete box. And they're all going to go, giddy, 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 let's go live in a concrete box. It's like, right. Okay. That's the reason why this event that's going to be happening. And I'm telling you, this uh, volcanic eruption could happen <clears throat> by the end of October. Yeah, that's and the terrifying. reason why is we're tracking Nemesis right now, and Nemesis is in a transition on my site. Uh, if you go to Signs 91, and I, we just got the numbers in for August, and uh, on Monday we'll do a mid-month snapshot or Sunday we do a mid-month snapshot. And actually we have to wait for them to process data and get caught up. So it'll probably be Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. And once we have that mid-month snapshot, it tells us what we want to know. But what we're seeing already from the data right. is that Nemesis is definitely in its perihelion phase. So what we're looking is to see when is it going to transition from perihelion to aphelion. And you have these uh, you have these different legs in the orbit. The orbit is 3,600 years. And m most of that, most all of that is in the southern skies. But when it's coming up from the southern skies, that's what's called the perihelion leg of its orbit. And then when it reaches its closest distance to the sun, that is perihelion. And then once it goes into, that is your, you know, you are in perihelion. So you're not out of the, you're, you're out of the perihelion leg or the phase of the orbit. And now you're in actual perihelion. Apihelion is the actual opposite point in the orbit the furthest point away from the sun. And once it goes into the downward south aphelion phase is when things start going sideways for us. And that is about to happen within a few weeks. And so we're seeing a lot of different signs, uh, land tears. There's all kinds of things going on. I see people are very observant, but they're not able to figure it back to the actual causality, which is nemesis. And nemesis is perturbing Earth in two very specific ways. It started in 1995. It creates energy. It has a it, it uh, it's a mysterious energy force that we haven't seen anywhere else but we know by statistical or excuse me by deep time sampling that this has happened before on our planet and uh, what's happening is that this is this is radiation that is coming from nemesis and it is going and it's affecting our sun and it's affecting earth how do we know it's affecting the sun well why did we have such a hot summer we had 1,400 cities across the globe. A really hot summer. Reporting hot summers. Because our uh, sunspot activity is much higher than it should be. All right? And we're in this anomalous thing. Yeah, we hit records, also, by the way, Marshall. Huh? I said we hit records, by the way, this yeah, summer. Yeah, mm -hmm. we hit records. And we're going to get, we're going to hit a lot more records, too. Um, so... What happened was in 1995, we started getting hit with this energy, all right? And then it started picking up. It was very subtle, and we could see 
you start tracking earthquakes of all magnitudes. You can see in 1995, it started picking up. And then what happens is that it has also got a lock on the inner core of our planet. And we have the inner core, which is solid, and then an outer core, which is fluid, and that creates our magnetic field. And then you have the mantle and the crust, all right? And right now, as we point out in our articles, that the inner core of the Earth is off balance. And this is what's causing a lot of problems. And also the viscosity and the, of the magma has increased. It flows more easily, more forcefully, and it's coming up in these large plumes and it's deforming the shape of the planet. The poles are coming closer together and the equator is more, you know, stretched out. It's kind of like a, a sort of an egg shape, but more uniform. And what's happening with the inner core is that it's off balance and it's like an off balance load in your washing machine, you know, and you can hear it, you know, you go, thump, ba thump, ba thump, ba thump, ba thump, and that's it, you know, turn off the machine, start pulling all the laundry apart and get it reorganized so that it's more distributed and then start the wash again. And so Earth right now, its core is off balance and it's affecting us. Now, this really started to become more pronounced in um, in the 2000s. And I remember in the late 2000s and into the 2010s, um, we had a lot of reports on Earth trumpets. Remember Earth trumpets? I do. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, the Earth trumpets were very real, and they were very spooky. A lot of videos of them. Um... The sound, yeah. the strange oh, yeah. sound. Yeah, it sounds like the Earth is in agony. And and it really is. Because the crust is being pushed from inside, you know, like blowing up a balloon, all right? And that's what's causing the, the crust of the Earth to change. And what causes uh, the sound trump, the, the trumpeting sound is... Think about the speakers in your car, your home stereo system, whatever, and you have that paper cone. And when it's, you know, you take the cover off and you're playing the music and you see the cone is moving. That's what creates the sound. All right. No differently with earth trumpets in the earth. And that's literally what was happening, just like making sound in your speakers. And that was what was generating these huge uh, sounds that nobody could trace. I mean, they couldn't say it's coming from here, it's coming from there. It was everywhere. It was all around the observers. They couldn't find a point of origin because literally the whole Earth beneath them was, you know, going nuts. Now, we're going to have Earth trumpets again, and they're going to even be much louder as we're going in the years from 2025 into 2030. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to have basically 25, 2025 and 2026. Those who survived the initial disasters are going to have an opportunity to build and prepare for the pole shift. And there's only one way to do that. You got to go to ground. That's the reason why I wrote my book, win-win survival handbook because i explain how to make concrete domes these are the strongest structures known to man and all you need to make a dome is some reinforcement rebar and concrete uh, you can and then a form and forms can be made of anything you can find at hand. An easy way to do it that I saw was done in Arcosante in Arizona was they built a mold of dirt shaped in the structure that they wanted, put 
rebar pigs into that. And then they did all the concrete, brought it up in layers all the way up to the top. And then when they were finished, they went in, they had a portal inside and they went in and removed all the dirt, trimmed all the pigtails, and then sprayed um, like stucco over the whole thing. And it was absolutely beautiful. And I remember I saw it uh, in 1974 or 75 when I was in college. And it was only like a couple of years old. Mm. And I just saw a picture of it recently from last year. It looked just as beautiful and as perfect as the day I saw it in seventy, in the 70s. So this is an easy way to build a very strong structure that can take the abuse that's coming. And you can get a community together. Now, one of the concepts that I am talking about in my articles is something I call freedom forts. And this goes back to something Trump was talking about uh, over a year ago with Freedom Cities in 2023. He talked about having, I believe, 10 cities that would be built on unused federal lands. Uh, that definitely is not Manhattan. And right, <laughs> you know, these yeah. are going to be located on in the flyover areas. I see the comms that are coming. If you know what to look for, as I do, I know they know. I know Trump knows. And I see them trying to, you know, bring concepts and ideas out and to get people opening their eyes to the very things we're talking about in this conversation. Trump would probably love to be able to have the freedom to speak about it as freely as I speak with you. Understood. And, and Marshall, I know we are sort of running out of time here, but I wanted to ask you about SpaceX, which uh, proposed just recently that they plan to start launching uh, starships to Mars in 2026. I, I wanted your thoughts and opinions on that. Go, man, go. And they're going to... You know, the thing of it is, is that SpaceX is our best solution for getting through this, maintaining communications, and then off-world colonization. After this pole shift, whoever is left alive is going to understand. If we do not heal our divides and come together as a species and get the hell out of here... The next time this thing comes around, that's it. This is the last survivable flyby. In the Colburn Bible that I publish, it yeah. talks about five previous flybys. Five. All right. And what I see happening with Nemesis is what's called the Kozai mechanism. And an object is either going to be flung out into space when it's orbiting a larger object in an irregular orbit like Nemesis, or it's going to circle the drain. Nemesis is circling the drain, so it's getting closer and closer to the sun, which is going to bring it more into area where it's going to cause devastation for us. So the next flyby, I think, will probably be much sooner than 3,600 years. I believe we're going to see uh, a major change after this flyby. We're going to see the orbital duration significantly reduced. And this has been observed with comets that pass close to uh, Jupiter and the gravity affects them and then their orbits change and reduce and, uh, you know, and how long it's going to happen. So. My guess would be is after this pull shift event in 2030, probably anywhere from about 1,800 to 2,000 years later, that will be it. All life on Earth will cease to exist. All life. 
even the cockroaches. Right. I feel like the elites know because not long ago, I also saw an article that said scientists want to build a doomsday vault on the moon. So they know what's coming. Oh, yeah. They know. They're aware. And you know what I really am disgusted is that NASA began observing Nemesis in 1983 with the IRAS telescope. All right. And they started their pack of lies right there. Because once they got it, they told their partners in Europe, oh, golly gee, the camera doesn't work anymore. They just changed the encryption codes and kept feeding the data and used up whatever hydrazine fuel was in the uh, spacecraft for navigation and maneuvering so that they could track it, Nemesis, for as long as they could. So the point here, and they knew it was there because it was from the pioneer probes. That's why they sent out the pioneer probes. They were looking for some sort of magnetic gravitational anomaly that would say, yeah, you got something big out there. All right. And they found it. And then they sent IRAS to image it and they did. And they got it. All right. And uh, years ago, I covered the the uh, Google missing star panels. It, you know where Nemesis was at that point. There's a big missing star panel in Google because Google uses the 1983 Sky Survey. We think Google's looking at the whole universe. It's not. It's just looking at what we saw in 1983 in the area where Nemesis was has been chopped out of the database, completely expunged. The point being is that our government has known about this for over half a century and have steadfastly in every way possible suppressed this knowledge and censored it in every way possible. It's why they censor me and are so cruel you can't even find me on the search engines anymore because they have just, that's it. I'm persona non grata. Anybody finds me, it's because you know about me, you've known about me, and or it's viral and somebody passes along. So getting back to it, now you understand what's coming. You know you got a government that wants you to die because they didn't give you a half a century of time to prepare. Imagine how many people wouldn't have to die if we had a half a century to prepare. They didn't want that. They wanted to be able to say, oh, golly, it came out from behind the sun. <laughs> Who knew? All right. They want to, you know, they, they always want to blame it on something else. That's right. And they love things that people can't see. So now you understand how the game is played. If Trump gets back into office, you got a fighting chance. You got a fighting chance. And that's the reason why I came up with my Freedom Fort concept, which is Freedom City is on a much smaller scale. It's rural. Yeah. You're talking about off-grid communities, young families, healthy, heterosexual, traditional values. And that's what we need. We need to get these young, wonderful people and get them to a place that's safe so that they can make families and make a future because we're going to need them as pioneers for the future. You know, after all the dust settles and we pick ourselves up, you know, the SpaceX, uh, the, the Starlink system, it's going to take a real beating during the flyby and it's going to become spotty. And for that reason, you're going to want to have radios, two way analog radios. And I talk about those in my book, Radio Free Earth, and tell people how to use them for survival purposes. So what you want to start doing now is really start getting information that's going to help you, being an aware, getting your consciousness up, develop, you know, have your relationship with Creator. If you're talking to Jesus, good for you. Keep doing it and do it more often. All right. And you're going to need because creator is going to give you inspiration and knowledge and help you with this. And so 
learn if there's any one thing I'm not asking, don't go out, you know, bullets, beans, bunkers. Yeah, that's all practical. More practical. Walk humbly with your God. All right. I and love that. this is literally creator wants you to get through this. Creator doesn't want you to file. This is a time of trial for all of us, not as nations, not as religions, not as political parties. Creator doesn't uh, judge us that way. Our affiliations are irrelevant. All that's relevant when your judgment comes is the choices you make and the outcomes of those choices. And that's all that's counted. So you don't get any brownie points for belonging to the right whatever. It's what you do, what you choose, and the outcomes of those choices. Lead a good life. Do more for others than for yourself as you can. And put your faith in Creator and pray Very every nice. night. Every night before you go to bed, say your prayers. My it's goodness. not stupid. It's, it's survival. Because that's the business of heaven, my friend. Everybody's got all these notions about what heaven is about. Heaven's about only one thing, and you only need one word to explain it. Survival. That is all heaven is about. And they're in service, and they want you to survive, and they want to help you. So now you have an idea of what's coming. You have the warnings. You have the wisdom. Trust yourself. Trust your instincts. Do not fall prey to people who are trying to infest you with doubts and anger and fear. These are the enemy. All right. Stay to yourself. Keep your own counsel. Walk humbly with your God. Be in awareness. And you will move through it more successfully than people who are suddenly going, oh, where's the FEMA water truck? All right. So that's about it. Very nice. Come into my site, yowusa.com or marshallmasters.com, and you'll find all the articles and everything I've been talking about and links to my books. Very nice. That's yowusa.com. And Marshall, once again, always a honor and pleasure to share the air with you. And I look forward to the next time we do one of these again. Oh, yeah. Oh, because I, man, I'd love being here on this show. You got an awesome audience. You got it, my friend. Talk to you soon. All right.